Hello and welcome to today's, uh, I guess you would call it a lesson. Uh, I want to help you to be able to get financial freedom and get to a place where you can be able to bless people the way that you want to be able to bless people. And part of that is going to be talking about tithing and giving. And because of that, I'm not going to put on the screen how you can tithe or give to us because I'm not trying to get you to tithe to us at all. So I'm not even going to ask you for a tithe. And that being said, I'm going to go ahead and roll the intro and then let's jump into this because I really do want to help you guys. And I hope that this is helpful and beneficial to y'all. All right. So one of the biggest things I hear in the church, in the body of Christ is number one, false accusations from people saying that we're just out for people's money. We're interested in ourselves, We're stealing people's tithes, this, that, and the other thing, which is not true because we give almost 50% of everything that comes in out to people. Right. And we do that because we love people and we understand how blessing people causes us to be blessed. Giving with a willing and cheerful heart causes us to be blessed. Another thing we hear is people say that tithing is not biblical, it's Old Testament, and therefore it doesn't stand now. And then they have this whole li list of things uh, that they disagree with about tithing, and they'll come after you. It is a big sacred cow in the body of Christ. So I've looked at the scriptures both for and against tithing, and usually they have the same scriptures against tithing. And so I'll just cover those very basically here. Then I'm going to talk about, you know, how do we get free from financial uh, burdens, essentially, to a point where we can give the way we want to give, where we can give. If God says, give this person $10,000 and you say, yes, Lord, I'll do it. What if $10,000 was everything you had in your bank account and you had to pay rent tomorrow? That was $3,000, but you have nothing in your bank account. The Lord just said, give all of this. That's a big test, right? That's a big test. What if he said, you know, give $28 to a homeless person and all you have is $28. And now you don't know if you're going to be able to put gas in your tank or milk for your baby or food on the table that night or whatever, because you're living paycheck to paycheck and every penny hurts. Every penny is stretched into copper wire. You know what I mean? Like you get down to brass tacks and you got them pennies and you're just pulling them out. You got rolls and reels of copper wire. Sell the copper wire. You can make a lot. You can actually make pretty good money off of selling copper at the scrapyard. I was <laughs> saying, talking about uh, a person who used to be poor and would go scrapping and collecting scrap metal on the side of the road, folks. I've been there. I know how it is. I've been there. All right. So. First thing I want to talk about is tithing. Has tithing been done away with? People will say, yes, tithing has been done away with. It's for Israel. It's for the Levites. It is not for, um, it, they'll say it's tithing is for the priests, but yet people were expected to bring a tribute to the priests. And people say, oh, well, tithing is according to the law. Well, when it wasn't a law, Jacob and Abraham both tithed tithes. Uh, Abraham tithed to Melchizedek 10% of everything that he had in Genesis, I want to say 14 or 15. I want to say it was Genesis 14. Uh, Jacob said that he was going to tithe a 10th of everything he had to God, but there was no law for tithing. So we see that tithing existed before the law. So is tithing a thing that is from the law? No, it's, it, it is. It is a biblical law, but it's designed to help you, but it's not the same now as it was in the old testament so we're going to get into it now jesus they say that you know jesus never said anything in the, in the new testament about tithing so therefore we don't have to tithe but what he did say was he was talking to the priests and he told them it behooves you to you know he, he says matthew 23 23 uh let me read it to you here um he says here i'm going to read it in the king james it says, woe well, unto you, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites, for ye pay the tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done and not to leave the other undone. Well, if you look in the Greek, it actually says, and it behooves you to practice these things. And that the word behooves means um, it to behoove is a duty or responsibility. But he says also... That's your duty, but also your duty is to remember justice, mercy, and faithfulness because those are all parts of the law as well. So if you neglect one, you neglect the other. 
right? Okay, now people will say, well, that's only pertaining to the priests, right? Well, is it pertaining to only the priests? Yes. Then are the priests required to tithe? Yes. Here's what I have to say about that, though. It says in Numbers 18.21 that the priests should tithe. It says in Malachi 3 that you should tithe. But it also says in 1 Peter 2.9 that you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood. You are God's new royal priesthood. So the laws that were implemented for the priesthood about tithing still apply to you. Jesus said, I didn't come to end the law. I came to he came to fulfill it. He didn't come to eradicate one jot or tittle of the law. He came to fulfill the law. The law still stands. Now, we don't live under the law because we see in, uh, where is it? Hebrews, I want to say, um, it says that Jesus became a priest. Uh, it's Galatians 3.13. It says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it says, he who is hanged on a tree is cursed. So you have that. Now what happens is we're redeemed from the curse of the law. So if you're not tithing, you're not going to come under the curses of Malachi, but you're also not going to receive the blessings that God promises in Malachi. And people say, well, God is uh, a mafia don then. He wants protection money. No. He says that if you do this, I will personally rebuke the devourer for you. <laughs> and I don't know about you, but I want God on my side, right? And that's what he says in Malachi 3. And if you actually do a word study in Malachi 3, when it says that the enemy will try to rob your, your seed, your fruit, this, that, and the other, what he's actually saying is the enemy will try to steal your children and kill your family is is what is going on why he tells the priests you don't tithe this is what the enemy is doing he's a devourer i will and that's what he does and god says i will rebuke them and so we get special benefits and blessing from that so the the tithe i do not believe has been done away with i believe it is something that we should still give the thing is people think that that means oh i'm supposed to give 10 percent. period all the time that's not the case. If you go to a church where the pastor is requiring you to give a tithe and, and keep monthly bank statements and show that, hey, you made this amount, this, that, and the other thing, and you give 10% no matter what, that's not biblical. That is not biblical, and you should run from that. Because what Paul tells us is uh, 2 Corinthians 9, 5 through 8, and so I'm just going to pull this up. I have it right here. Um, he's talking to the Corinthians, and he wants to give a blessing uh, I believe to the Macedonians, right? And uh, he says, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go to you ahead of time and prepare your generous gift beforehand, which you had previously promised, that it may be ready as a matter of generosity and not as a grudging obligation. And that, that's something like saying um, that so it won't be a compulsion. We're not supposed to give out of a compulsion. It says, but this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes, or as you decide in your own heart, not grudgingly or out of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. So, if we sow cheerfully and give cheerfully, then we will see grace abound to us and we will have all of our needs met in abundance so that we can do every good work that God wants us to do. So why do we give? So that we can be provided for and have, as it says here in verse, verse 8, may have an abundance for every good work. Okay. Um, and then if you want to even go on, it says he has dispersed abroad. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness while you are enriched in everything for all liberality, which causes thanksgiving through us to God for the administration of the service not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also is abounding through many thanksgivings to God. While through the proof of this ministry, they glorify God for the obedience of your confession to the gospel of Christ and your liberal sharing with them and all men and by your prayer for you who long for you because of the exceeding grace of God 
in you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Okay. So I love that. That's awesome. Because he says, here's, you're going to get, uh, you're, you sow, you give generously, and God's going to give generously back to you. And it says that also in, uh, uh, it's Luke 638, but I didn't have it up here on my screen, but I have it written down. Luke 638, it says, give and it will be given to you a good measure, pressed down, shaken and overflowing or running over. Uh, shall men give unto your bosom? That word for bosom is colpon. It means pocket. It will give into your pockets. It was a little pocket that was created when the overhang of their garments would hang over like a little flap. They would create a pocket on their chest. So that's what it means when he uses the word colpon. For the same measure that you measured, or by the same measure which you met, M-E-T-E, it will be measured back to you. And then, you know, Paul reiterates that in his letter to the Corinthians and says, if you sow sparingly, you reap sparingly. If you sow uh, generously, you reap generously. And then um, we see an example of a tithe where in 1 Corinthians 16, 2, Paul says, set aside a portion each week as you see fit in your own heart. Let each man give according to what they see fit in their own heart. Um, so let me see if I can um, actually pull this up here. Uh, 2 Corinthians 16, 2. 1 Corinthians 16, 2. And we'll just uh, take a look and read that real quick. Uh, it says here, On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper so that there will be no collecting when I come. Now, let's take a look at that in uh, a couple different languages and see. Let's start right off in. I'm going to go to the New King James for this. Now, concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. Okay, so this isn't the first church that he said this. This is something that Paul required from the churches. Why? So he could give it to the saints to help them, to help the people in the body of Christ. That is what we do here at Fireside Grace. When we say, hey, we have a need to meet for a family, it's because we're paying somebody's electric bill. We're paying for somebody's groceries. We're paying for someone's Christmas. We're putting food in their cabinets. We're giving them a car because they don't have a car and they're disabled, had back surgery, um, have bills that need to be met or whatever it is that the Lord is, has brought before us and, and to our attention to provide. This is why the tithe was being taken, and this is what we do as the body of Christ. And this is what it was supposed to be done by the priests as well. When they received the tithe, they were supposed to give it. That's why Jesus said it behooves you not to neglect these things also, which was mercy, justice, and, and faithfulness. And that was what? To meet the needs of the people around them. It wasn't just to bless the priests so that the priests could get rich. And if you actually did some study, you would find out that the priests were pretty corrupt and they were having unjust scales and unjust measures at the time and, and, and so forth. But anyway, we go back to 1 Corinthians 16. It says, concerning the collection for the saints, as I've given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must also do. On the first day of each week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. And when I come, whoever you approve of by your letters, I will send to bear your gift to Jerusalem. But if it is fitting that I go also, they will go with me. Now I'll come to you, Pastor Macedonia, and it may be that I will remain for a while or even spend the winter with you, that you may send me on my journey wherever I go. For I do not wish to see you now on the way, but I hope to stay a while with you if the Lord permits. Anyway, getting on here, this is, you know, he's talking about the collection for the saints. He's saying, hey, lay aside some money. Why? Because he doesn't want to get there and then they have to give begrudgingly or feeling of a compulsion where they feel like they have to give based off of a compulsion, which means a grudging, uh, grudgingly giving, meaning that you're giving, but you wish you didn't have to. Now, what does God require for a tithe? He does not require you to put aside 10%. Really, if you want to go based on New Testament standards, it's 100%. Because people were literally selling all of their land in the book of Acts, selling all of their land and all of their possessions and giving it to the disciples so that the disciples could meet the needs of the body of Christ. And it says so that nobody was in lack, that so that nobody had a need that was not met. So the tithe shifted from going to the priests who were neglecting it to going to us, who Peter says, 
we, we are in first Peter two, nine chosen people, a royal priesthood. He also says it in uh, two, four or two, five, wherever it is also says that we are a royal priesthood. So he says it twice once and then he reiterates it. We are the royal priesthood. So now we aren't living under the curses associated with this, but God is saying, hey, just give what you want to give in your heart. The Old Testament standard was give at least 10%. Listen, those guys, they wanted to do everything according to the law. There wasn't wiggle room for grace, but they would give, you know, God in, in the New Testament, we would give 100% of everything, which is what we're trying to get to. I wish that we could just give 100%. As soon as something came in, we could give it out that we could be so debt free that we didn't have to worry about anything, that everything was just covered and paid for. Because if I can do that, I want to do that, right? Now, what I hear a lot of times is people saying, well, if I just had the money, then I would give the way that God wants me to give. If I just had that money right here and right now, I would give the way God wants me to give. Well, would you give the way God wants you to give without the money is the real test. Because it's easy if you have $100,000 in your bank account for God to say, give this person $1,000. What's that to you? It's nothing. It's what? 1%? Is it something like that? Is it 1% of, of your, your money, right? And that's nothing to you. It's a drop in the hat. Oh, you still have $999,000 in the bank. You know what I mean? Or 900, you have 90... I guess it would be $98,000 or $99,000, whatever, in, in the bank. You still have that. You know what I'm saying? You still have a ton of money. You can still invest. You can still do things, whatever. But what if he says to you, I want you to give twenty everything in your bank account to a homeless person right now and scrounge up every penny that you have in your house, every penny you have in your car, in your purse, your pants, your dryer, your couch cushions, all of it. Give every single cent that you have now. Well, God asked us to do this. He did ask us to do this. We were living in an RV. We were living paycheck to paycheck. Brandy had taken a job that her pay became less than half of what she was making hourly. And her hours were cut down to like 20 hours a week instead of she was working 40 to 50 hours a week. Um, for quite a bit of money to working for less than way less than that we were living under poverty and then <laughs> god had told me about a year before that he wanted me to focus on ministry full-time and stay home and that was hard for me i struggled for that because i'm the man i'm the provider right i'm the one who takes care of the family right <laughs> until i got a check and realized that i wasn't actually god is actually the provider and my income didn't actually pay the bills it was brandy's income that paid the bills because she had a college education and i didn't i thought i was making good money single by myself but not enough to take care of a family of three plus a dog you know what i'm saying so that was a wake-up call but god tells us give everything we have to this homeless person well everything that we had was 28 dollars after we scrounged everything up ever took everything out of the bank that was our gas money. That was our food for the rest of the week, as far as we knew. That was milk for the baby. That was everything that we had. Do you understand how hard it is to give 100% when you have maybe one bottle of milk left for your son and God says, give it all? That we heard this at two separate times where I was in one area, she was in another area praying. She heard it and I heard it and we came together and say, I felt like God said to do this. And they're like, well, yeah, I felt like God said that too. So we do it. So what do we do? We get smart. Let's go get food and give it to the homeless people instead of giving them money. So we tell, we're talking to these people and they're like, well, what do you want this? What are you getting this food for? And we're like, well, we're going to give it to a homeless person uh, to, to feed the homeless. What do they do? They give us it for free. So now we have the money and the food. And the Lord says, I didn't ask you to give them food. I asked you to give them the money. And we're like, dang. So we get a double blessing. We get to feed the homeless now, and we still have to give $28 away, which doesn't seem like it's a lot, but it's 100% of everything you have. I can't stress to you how big of a step it was for us because we had nothing. We had lost our home. We were homeless for three months. We finally got an RV to stay in. COVID hits. And we are just desperate. We ended up going 18 weeks with no paycheck, but we were obedient and the Lord paid for all of our bills. And now here we are. But we had to give the way wanted us, God wanted us to give 
without having to have that money in the bank. So that when the time comes, when he says to us, I want you to give this family a car, we could say, no problem. We don't need two cars. Let's give them this car that's paid off with no problems with it, with brand new tires and brand new brakes and motor mounts and all this thousands of dollars of work done on it. So it's in great condition. Let's do that. <laughs> but we had to be tested for it first. So when you think to yourself, how am I going to get financial freedom? What do I have to do? And it pains you to hear you have to give. But you say, well, I give, I tithe. That's God's money anyway. That 10% is his. It says all the money, everything in this world is his. That's God's money. You're giving him his money. That he said, will you just give me 10% back to me so that I can use it to take care of my people? But if we really want that freedom, it doesn't come from tithing as much as it comes from blessing people around you. It's Christmas time, folks. There are single moms and single dads. There are families who aren't even single moms or single dads. That They're just struggling families like me and Brandy were at one point, And all they need is diapers and milk. Or they don't have a turkey. Do you know how many times we went where we would be eating just like a cup of rice? And then God asks us to give everything we have when we have nothing. But look at where we are now. We're able to bless people on a grand scale. We're able to see things come in and send things back out. Our needs are met. Sometimes it's a stretch to tell you the truth because we grow, we hire people, we have things going on, we have projects, we're giving to people, and it becomes tight, especially around this time of year. But God said, if you want people to sow into you and pour into you, then you have to pour into them. That's when you get the overflow. And yeah, there's going to be testing. Yeah, there's going to be struggles. Yes, there's going to be trials. But if somebody told me and I received it, that all I had to do was bless people with a cheerful heart and I would be able to break free from this financial struggle, then I would do it. It took us two years. Yeah. It took us two years to get to where we are now. Will we do it again? I'd prefer not to. But if I just understood what I'm telling you right now, if I just understood that that was the key to freedom, I would do it. I would do it in a heartbeat. Don't worry about what you can do by the works of your own hands. Don't worry about how much you can save each week or how much you can give each week. Just worry about meeting the needs of the people around you. Worry about buying diapers for that family that doesn't have diapers for their newborn baby or formula for a baby that needs formula. Maybe take your pastor out to lunch and pay for it for them. And don't ask anything of them. Just ask them how they're doing and let them talk. Don't even ask them for prayer. Just be a blessing. Just be a blessing to the people around you. Go out and see that homeless person standing there. So what if they're doing drugs and drinking? Take them a sandwich. Take them a Thanksgiving dinner plate and say, Hey, I just wanted to give you this blanket. I know it's cold out here. And these warm socks and a, and a plate of food for you. Merry Christmas. I love you. I love you. God loves you. Have this. Go buy a kid a bike, a musical instrument. Go bless somebody. Give your waiter a tip that's bigger than what you paid for dinner or your waitress. Buy somebody's coffee behind you or in front of you. Pay for somebody's drink at the drive-thru or somebody's meal at the drive-thru. And then tip somebody. If you will bless people, God will bless you. Why? Because then he can trust you with what he's given you. And that's how you get financial freedom. That's how you get free from the world system. That's how you get blessed with your decisions that you make. That's how you do it. Tithing is good. Tithing is biblical. And I do believe it's for today. But the real, real way to get free is to give with a cheerful heart, with no other motive 
then you want to meet the needs of the people around you.